friends, Jerry Rosa here at the Rosa Stringworks Workshop. You just heard a Lower LM310F BRB. It's in for the full meal deal setup. Just give you a full look at it here. It's got the squared off fretboard. There's the side. It's kind of plain, basically. Decent looking mandolin. First impressions, the action's high. The sound is... Actually, the tone of the sound is pretty good. The sound is very muted, in my opinion. It doesn't have much punch at all. There's lots of sharpness. Uh, this Brit... <laughs> You know, I'm, I guess I shouldn't do that, but my hand rubs there a little bit as I play, and I can just feel how sharp that is everywhere. It annoys me. Up here, it's not too bad. So, anyway, we're going to give this the full meal deal. The customer wants me to go with the deer antler. We'll just see how it turns out. And You've heard the before, and soon you'll hear the after. Pretty much as always, I first thing I do is I look down the fretboard, and I can see on this side, there's a little more underbow than on this side. There is a slight underbow all the way. And I wouldn't think that that's too much. But as I look down through the middle of it, I can see it just looks like there's a little more than it really needs. To me, if you can see the underbow pretty clearly on a mandolin, then it's probably got more than it needs. So that's going to be the very first thing I'm going to look at here. I'm going to go ahead and take the truss rod cover off. I know most people do that with a straight edge and look at the underbow, but I, I really feel like I do it just fine with my eye. Okay, this has got one of those uh, hidden truss rods. The end, believe it or not, the end of the truss rod is right about here where you have to adjust it, right about where I have my finger there. So, in other words, the wrench has to go all the way in to about here before it even touches the truss rod. This is the size it often takes. I'll just see if it works on this one. Probably not in this case. Actually, it looks like it's going to need a bigger one, but I don't think it's going to work. It's really far up here. Why they put it that far up, I don't know. To me... Logic, I mean, just common sense logic tells me that's defeating part of the purpose. You're already up this far, so now you're only bending it from here to here. When you're back here and you're and let's say you make your contact right here outside the fretboard, well, you've got a lot more leverage. Your truss rod wouldn't have to work so hard. That's issue number one. Issue number two is because it's up here so far and this peg head is slanted, I'm reaching up to get it. And now the wrench is at an angle, and I'm exaggerating, but if my finger is the truss rod, the wrench is trying to go in the truss rod slot like that, or in the, in the head. And so, you know, you're, you're just working at a disadvantage. And I honestly don't know if I can get it in there. It's, it's that much of an angle. The, the, the underside of the peg head here, the underside of the peg head, is actually pushing the wrench down where I can't get up, you know, I can't tilt it up. I don't know if I can adjust this. I really don't. And, and I think it looks like it's going to take a bigger wrench, which will just make it that much more difficult. So let me see if I can find the proper wrench. I suppose what a guy really needs for this is to have an Allen wrench with the ball end on it that would work at an angle. I don't have any of those wrenches, so I don't have that ability. I found this crazy Allen wrench, which is long enough to get past the end of the peg head, which lets me get up in there, and it seems like it's turning it. So I'm going to turn it about a half a turn there, or maybe a little more to where it's really good and tight. I, you know, I've loosened the strings, by the way. It looks pretty good and flat right there. Um, you know, I feel like that that actually got in there and was doing the job. I'm going to tighten it just a little bit more, another eighth of a turn there. Okay, we're going to call that adjusted, at least for now. I'm even going to go ahead and put the truss rod cover back on it. I feel like I have a pretty good feel for those things, and I doubt I'll have to readjust it. 
Now that I have the strings loose, what I usually do is just fold the bridge down, take it out, then I just cut the strings. Ain't nobody got time for all the other nonsense. We'll put a felt, you know, permanent felt deal on both of these. That's a, I think, a better way than that. Although this is fine, it's just annoying to me because it always falls out and slides around. Okay, when I've got the strings off of it, as I rub my fingers up and down, it's sharp as it can be right on the edges. Since there is no such thing as a perfectly fret, fretboard, in my opinion, first thing I'm gonna do is just take my tool. This is a homemade tool. It's, it's a uh, six inch bastard file, and you have to make sure that you put the concave side up when you glue this to your board and the convex side down, and you think files are flat, right? Well, they're not. When you look down them, you'll see that every file pretty much out of the package has a little bit of a bow to it. Just very slight, but you wanna, you wanna turn it the way I told you to turn it there in order for it to work well as a fret file. This fretboard does look exceptionally flat. I don't feel any high spots as I'm filing it. I can feel them almost instantly. Um, it, it feels pretty flat, so I'm not gonna do too much to it. Now I'll just look at it up close to make sure all the frets were filed. There's a spot right here and this fret here are not hardly touched at all, right? Right in the middle here, and right here is barely touched at all, so we'll go a little bit more. Yes, I know most people dye these and take all that amount of time to do that. I don't do that because I don't feel like I need to. I can see it. I can see the shine, and I can tell which ones have been filed. Okay, that took a little bit more filing than I was expecting since it looked pretty flat. It was just that one low fret. There's a spot right here that's barely, barely touched, but it looks like it's touched. I'll just go over it a little bit more. I know it won't really show up well in the video, but what I look at is, you know, I make sure that they're all shiny, that they've all been touched, they've all got a little flat spot on them. Also, when you look at them real close and inspect them, you'll see that some are, the, the flat spot is much wider than others, meaning that that was a higher fret. These are actually pretty uniform. There's very little difference, but there are some differences, but they're very minor. So it's fine. I think we're good on that. When I recrown these frets, I don't like to take every bit of the flat spot off. I like to leave just the hint of the flat spot. That lets me know that it's still level with the rest of them. If you take the flat spot off, you don't know if you're a thousandths lower now or two thousandths lower or what. So I don't go crazy on this filing deal. These frets are kind of in between. I put the small crown back on here. I had the medium one in the file. I might, I might go back to the medium one. This is working. I don't know, it's working pretty good. These, like I said, these frets are just kind of in between. That looks pretty good, pretty uniform, so we're gonna go with that. The customer also mentioned changing out the nut. I'm gonna say this very direct. I never change the nut unless there's a problem with the nut. Now, you might say, well, you know, antlers gotta sound better than plastic. Well, if it does, I can't hear the difference. At this end of the instrument and at this end of the instrument, about all I hear differently when you change anything is sustain. And the sustain generally comes from having a heavier tailpiece and from a heavier peg head. It has even very little to do with the nut, other than if the nut's not cut correctly, it will kill your sustain. In other words, if the, the fret, I'm exaggerating, but the, the, the angle has to be like this. And so that the last place that the string makes contact with the nut is this very outside edge. 
the, the nut itself has almost nothing to do with the sound and the tone and all that, in my opinion. Now, I know other people would argue with me till, they, till the cows come home. If you play a lot of open notes, perhaps you'll hear some difference in the nut. But you got to play open notes before the nut's even into play. If you're playing a closed note, that nut doesn't have a thing to do with your sound. So, you know, in my opinion, for the amount of time it takes to change the nut out, and you're talking at least an hour and a half at 80 bucks an hour, so 120 bucks to, to fix this nut that's not broke. This is, looks like a perfectly good nut to me. I don't see anything wrong with it. I don't know for sure it's probably plastic, but it almost looks like bone, to be honest. So I don't know, but it, it's, it's at least a decent quality plastic. Now, if it was a real soft plastic, which I've seen that already, and if, and if I file it and I find that it's a soft plastic, we'll change it out. But, but as long as it's a good hard plastic, one that holds the string well, there's no reason to change it, in my opinion. No point in spending $120 for that. You know, let the arguments begin, I guess. <laughs> That already feels a lot better. So basically all I'm doing there is I'm just kind of 45 in the, the fret and I'm kind of rounding it. I'm not just 45ing it, I'm rounding it as I do it. And now you just don't feel it like you did. It used to catch, you could actually catch your finger on that, but now it slides. You feel the bump, but you don't feel the sharpness. Okay, so I think that fretboard looks good. I'm gonna look down it again. And just looking down at right now, it looks just as flat as a pancake. A lot of people, again, will argue that you should go this way with your frets. I don't find a problem going this way at all. Um, they say it may, leaves grooves in them. Well, if you can feel a groove from a piece of 600 sandpaper, then you're much more sensitive than I am. This is a much faster way to do it. It saves the customer tons of money and it makes them shine up real nice. And the last additional advantage is that I'm not gonna file one fret shorter than the rest of them because I'm keeping them all filed at the same time or polished, I should say. This really just polishes them and shines them up, makes them look like new. The uh, nut popped off of there. That gives me a better look at it. I think it's bone actually. I really do. It does not look just like standard plastic at all. It could still be plastic, but it doesn't look like it. I'm going to file the back edge of it here. I'm pretty sure it's bone. It's a very hard piece, so there's really no reason to replace that at all. And it just takes so long to make it and get the action perfect up there where if you've already got a piece, there's no reason to do that. Okay, so now we'll take a single edge razor blade and clean up the fretboard. There's lots of little, you know, use, abuse scratches. Here's some kind of a scratch right, I don't even know if it'll show up, but it, it the scratch goes like this at an angle right here that you might be able to see if I turn it just right. But you know, we'll clean all that up with a single edge razor blade. These frets don't appear to be very wide, but they are really tall frets. Which is not my favorite, I gotta be honest. I like frets that are shorter. For me personally, it just feels like the action is lower when the frets are closer to the fretboard. Part of that's my style because I, I squeeze, admittedly squeeze the strings too tight. If you squeeze the strings tight, you will notice a significant difference between low frets and high frets. Now we're just going to take the oil, this is boiled linseed oil, and we're going to wipe it down. You don't have to leave the linseed oil on there very long at all. In fact, I wouldn't leave it on more than a minute or two. And then I would wipe every bit of it off that you can get off. You don't want to leave any sticky film on there, and that's what will happen if you leave it on there. I'm finding that this uh, 
Formula 560 glue is very good for gluing these nuts back on also. I really like it for gluing the nuts on for a couple of reasons. You don't have to worry about your finish at all. If you get it on anything, it wipes off with water. And again, it holds really well. And it sets up pretty fast too. Well, now we need to, first of all, check and make sure that the feet sit real well. Okay, they don't set perfect, but they, they're close. They're actually pretty close. There's, it's really setting on the toes. And what happens is when it sets on the toes, the bridge will go down and make contact with the top. There's no question. But that's putting a lot of pressure out here on these toes and it makes marks on your instrument eventually. I can see the beginnings of marks on this one, but they're just the beginnings. It's, we caught it in time where it's not gonna make a big deal of problem. So what we'll do, this is 220, wet or dry. This is the stuff I get at Lowe's. It's called Sandblaster Pro. I love this stuff because the uh, sanding doesn't build up on it. It really does work well. And you try to get this placed. Of course, you want your, uh, you know, your treble and your base in the right orientation. And you want to try to sand this right about where it's going to go. So you put your sandpaper there and you sand. Now, I'm pressing kind of hard. If I was pressing lighter, you can see just the tips are, are touching. But I want to sand it until the whole thing is touching pretty well on its own. Once again, I slightly press backwards, but only slightly. The main thing is you don't want it leaning forward. It's still a little heavy on the toe, especially on this base side. So I'm going to press on this base side a little bit more. Just the slightest amount of pressure now makes it fit really well. I would like to have it fit well without any pressure myself. I believe we can get away with that. Okay, we're going to take a small file now and knock off the corners again just to round them off. Doesn't take a lot, just enough to where they're not digging in. Before I take the saddle off of here, I'm gonna mark it as the base and treble sides. This is the treble side here, so I'll put a T on that side and base on this side. Then I'm going to take this off because we're going to put a deer antler piece on here. As most of you know, Ron, I've contracted with my buddy Ron to make these deer antler saddles now, and he's learning how to make them and doing a pretty darn good job now. I still have to do quite a bit of handwork to every saddle. It's, I just like to file them a little smoother. They're actually pretty smooth coming off of the saw, but you know, they can just be nicer. So that's what I do is I file every one, try to smooth up and get rid of most of the saw marks. I also file them a little bit for consistency. Sometimes the saw doesn't cut them just perfect. And so I try to file them where they look a little bit more uniform and, and symmetrical and that type of thing. Now I'm knocking off the sharp edges on the top of the saddle so that your hand doesn't feel it when you're using it. Then I rub around to make sure it's not sharp anywhere. Even these bottom edges, I, I like to just touch them a little bit. I don't always do that on the bottom edges because you really don't feel those. But I do take and, and take and run the file over this again just to get rid of the saw marks to make it smooth here on the bottom. Where, this is where the adjuster will set. 
Okay, so that gets them cleaned up to where they're real nice and smooth. Now I need to mark the grooves in it. I keep this piece of plastic under here at all times because I make a lot of these. I have it marked as treble and bass, and so I know which way to turn it here. And I center it up by eye pretty much, and then just mark where the grooves need to be. Then I double check it to look, make it look at it to see if it looks like the grooves are in the right place symmetrically across it. They look pretty good. And if they do need to be adjusted even a little bit, I can actually do that just through experience right here as I file the grooves. The base side here, I just, I just roll the three-cornered file a little bit and it does a nice job. I don't, I don't go real deep. As a matter of fact, I'm angling it so that the cut basically stops at the front edge of the saddle. So I don't really go deeper than the front edge of the saddle. I'm just cutting the grooves in the back of the saddle, if you will. So then when you look at the saddle from the front edge there, this would be the string side of the saddle. You really don't hardly even see the little notches. They're there, but they're very faint. And then the notches are much more pronounced on the back side. Okay, now to put the saddle on the bridge, you look for your treble side. The part that sticks out in front here the part that sticks out in front here is the, is the treble side. In other words, you see this side here has been filed on both sides. That's the base side. The treble side is, is sticking out towards the uh, peg head. Now, I'm going to put this on here. I already knew I was going to have trouble. These posts on this are very tall. Look at those posts. You can see how tall they are. Now, I'm going to leave them that way right now because maybe these adjusters have to come up and you know I'll just adjust them up to where it's sitting on the adjusters but I have a feeling it's going to be high although maybe not it, it may be okay we, we might get away with this one if you have to though sometimes you just have to file those posts off I'm putting on the GHS LS250 strings in my opinion, they're the best string uh, to bring out the lows in a mandolin, and they still bring them out without messing up the highs. I'm going to show you how I put on the strings here. Uh, I'm, I'm wrapping it around, you know, from the inside around. That's just starting to get one wrap. Then I wrap a second wrap around there, and then I, co I hold those down with my fingernail. Then I come back through and I slide the string over the top of, of the strings through the hole there. That way you can pull it up tight and it only takes a couple of turns and your string is up to tension, see? It's already up to tension. So there's not a ton of wrapping there and it wraps the string down the post by doing it that way. I only do this on the base side, but I might add the other side, I use a different method on the treble side because the strings are so much smaller. So once again, I'll show you here. I, I pull the string tight like this. So it's pulled tight. I go around the post from the inside, around the outside, back around it. Just take my fingernail, hold, hold the strings down run the string right back through the hole, right over the top of the strings on the outside. Pull it in, tighten it up. That way your string's already basically tight when you put your string on, and yet it's got enough wrap around the post to be good. Well, I'm turning the wrong button there, sorry. <laughs> anyway, you just turn it a couple of turns and it's ready to go. So there's no reason to even need a string winder with that method. And I find string winders to be a real pain in the neck myself, especially on mandolins. They're just awkward. Although I know there's some pretty good ones out there. As I sometimes do, I got ahead of myself because I'm trying to show these techniques on camera. And I forgot to put the felt in here, so we'll just do it now. I just loosen this, those two base strings back up. And I slide. The, this felt is sticky, so it's a little hard to get under there and I just slide it into place 
mash it down real good, and then I just fold it back under there. And this one, it needs it folded back under there too because this one is just about sitting on the top. So that felt under there is probably a good thing in this case. Just slide this piece of plastic under there to make sure that it's getting under there really well because it's right down against the top for the most part. Anyway, that, that'll take care of that. We'll put the other piece of felt on this and I always slide this up as far as I can get it where you don't see it. So we'll put it right up underneath these two round pieces here. And when we put that back on, then the strings are sandwiched between felt. That's the way I like to do it. On the treble side, I do it differently. I'm going to put in this first A string up here at the top. I go, you know, I, I, I put the string through the hole like, like normal. And, you know, I do it a lot of different ways. You can use a method. I use a two-finger method sometimes like this. Put two fingers under here and pull it up tight. And that's a good method. But lately, I've just been doing it by eye, and I'll just show you, it, you know, because I haven't shown this particular technique on, on camera, I don't think. But I just basically pull it up to the, to the point where it's, it's tight, but yet there's a loop back over to this side. And in other words, I've got it pulled up tight to the opposite side, if you will. And then I just go back under the string on the inside of the peg head there which is hard to show on camera here without blocking your view. And then I just, and these are short strings, and then I just grab the string and pull it up like that. The reason I do that on the treble side is that locks uh, the string in place. Now you can see that that pretty much gives me my two fingers here also. So it's, you know, six and one half, half a dozen in the other. This method's much faster when I'm not trying to show it. <laughs> so anyway, that's just another method. You know, it just keeps the amount of string consistent that's on the post. Now, granted, I like more string on the treble posts than I do on the bass posts. Maybe you can see how it's winding there and going down the post. The reason I like more string on there is it spreads the stress out. Instead of putting the stress at the single point where the hole is, you know, you've got more windings and there, the string will wrap around there and spread that stress out before it gets to the tension point at the hole. So more wraps on treble strings is a good thing. But again, I don't bother with the string winder thing. I just find it more trouble than it's worth. Everybody has their own thing though, so if you like them, that's fine with me. I don't have a problem with that. Got her all up to pitch. Now I'm just gonna start checking for action and stuff like that. I did check the intonation, it looks pretty good. You can see here that this is the 18,000th pick and it just slides right under there. Now it starts to get tight on the D string, but under the G string it's really high. So it's, no, it's not even touching the G string, but so we've got some we can take off there. Yeah, I believe this is bone. Looks pretty good now. Those two are nice. The two D's are pretty good. Maybe just a fraction of a hair on the D's. I'm mostly wanting to file all the strings just to make sure the angle's right and that the strings are ending where they should. And I don't think they're filed that well right now. The other thing is that the, I think the uh, grooves are a little narrow and they hug the string on the sides and that's not good in my opinion. I, I would rather see them a t just a hair loose than a hair tight. That's it right there. It doesn't move when you press it down. It's not too bad on the height there. I can just tell by the look of these, these are high. They're not real high. They're just a little high. They're not snug enough. They're, they're actually snug on the 18,000s, but I like to make it a little bit tighter. 
They don't need much, so I'm not trying to go much deeper. Mostly just getting the angle right. Okay, before we get into playing it, we've uh, got one last issue, and that is, you can see here's my test that I use, the uh, 1.14 millimeter pick at the seventh fret, and it slides in pretty easily. It doesn't stay there. It's not crazy high at all. It's playable where it's at, but you can go lower and it would sound better. So I, I lowered this down as low as I could go, and the problem with that is now the saddle is actually sitting on top of the post. Yes, I could drill the holes all the way through, but I don't like the holes all the way through. I, I prefer the smoothness of the top. So I'm going to take these posts down a little bit. This is not the standard bridge that I typically put these on, and these posts are just taller. So we're just going to file them off just a little bit. Okay, before filing these off, they have a little screw thing on the top, just, and I just put a screwdriver in there to make sure that they were bottomed out and they are and of course I had these up so that they didn't bottom out but anyway I, I checked to make sure that the post was bottomed out and they are bottomed out so then I run these all the way down and then I just measured them consistently to make sure they were about the same and they are pretty close to the same so I'm just now going to file off I'm going to file off all of the uh, str uh, the uh, groove for the screwdriver and maybe just a little bit past that. And the best way to do it is to just mark it with a sharpie so that you're kind of consistent. We could do this on a grinder or a sander or whatever, but generally you can file it off pretty fast with something like this. So that's what we're going to try first. I've already got rid of the uh, screwdriver slot there, and I'm putting my thumb on the opposite side of this so I'm not breaking it off down in the wood here. I think that will probably be enough to do it, and yet they're still pretty darn tall. Just double checking to see if, if I've got them pretty uniform, pretty close. We'll put the saddle back on here. And now the saddle almost, when they're all the way down, almost touches. So that's that should be a plenty. That should be plenty. Raise it up a little bit because I know it's going to have to go up a little bit. So that should work just fine like that. Well, it never goes as easy as it should, you know. I was making some fine adjustments here, trying to get the action just right, and you have to loosen the strings a number of times. And on these lowers, I've had this happen on, on the lowers before. They break the strings, especially the E strings, right here at the at the post. And I've already done it to the first. The first one broke, and then the second one broke. And it's not from over tightening. It's actually it usually breaks while you're loosening it. Believe it or not, and both of those did break while I was loosening the string. Anyway, make a long story short. Um, if you take and you take a little fine rat tail file. Now this is a very fine one here, and you then just take and and just kind of. I got the post turn where the hole is going through at this angle at the moment right now. You can see how the post the file is going through there. And then I go across both of the, the edges of the holes with this round file and just lightly polish it up like that. And it gets rid of the sharpness right on those corners there. And then I turn the post all the way around where I can get to it from the outside because it's hard to do from the inside. And then I do the same thing to that side. I don't generally have any problem with anything but the E strings on these lowers, but it's happened several times and I've done that and it seems to fix the problem. So that's what I'd recommend if you're having that trouble. And now I gotta put yet another new string on here. That's the second new E string since I put the pack on. Well, we got her all tuned up. I just thought I'd show you one more thing. You know, down here, you've got all this fancy stuff where people bend their strings around and hook it on here and all that. Um, it's kind of like those power pins. In my opinion, this was a solution looking for a problem. 
I used to wrap them around and do all that extra stuff, but anymore and for the last 15 or 20 years, I've just been hooking them straight on and I haven't had any problems. So that's what I do and you can, you're welcome to hook them on and wrap them around if you think that works better. But I find this works just fine and doesn't create any problems. We'll let you make up your own mind on the sound. I think it sounds better myself, but I'll leave it up to you to decide. Got the action very low. You can see here at the seventh fret, holds the pick, no problem. And uh, down here it's crazy low, so it's really easy to fret. It makes it, it feels better with those real high frets. I, they just are way high for me. Well, here we go, play that same tune. a little more volume, definitely more clarity, but to be perfectly honest with you, it, it's still lacking something in the high strings. It may wake up with some playing. It's not, not quite as, you know, not quite as punchy as I'd like to hear, but I don't think it hurt it at all to put, to do what we did to it. I think it helped it some. You know, it's definitely much better set up in terms of playability and all that and the smoothness and the intonation is absolutely perfect on it now. So he ought to be in real good shape. It's a real good mandolin to, uh, if you if he's learning, and I believe he is, uh, it's a great mandolin to learn on. It's, it plays so easy now. I hope you like that uh, look at the mandolin and hopefully you got some new tips there. I think I shared a couple of extra new tips that I hadn't really talked about before. It's a lower mandolin. Once again, it's an LM310F BRB. I'm not even going to try to figure out what all that means. It doesn't matter to me. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching. Tell your friends to take a look. If you're not subscribed, please click the subscribe button. And then after that, click that little bell icon and you'll be notified whenever I put out a new video. And always remember to kill a troll by clicking the thumbs up. Thank you very much.